May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our heart, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. An American businessman was walking down the beach in Mexico one day, admiring the, the shelves and the ocean. And he happened upon a uh, fisherman who was just coming in with his daily catch. And he had some magnificent yellowfin tuna in the boat, this big, wonderful fish. And he said, well, how long did it take you to catch those fish? And he said, oh, not long, a few hours. Oh, well, why didn't you stay out longer and catch more fish? Well, sir, this is all my family needs. I have a good life. And the businessman looks at him and says, but, but you don't understand. See, if you went out and fished all day, you could, you know, you could buy a bigger boat. Well, sir, I'm, I'm very busy. What do you do the rest of the day? Well, I sleep in, fish a little, play with my kids, have a siesta with my wife. And in the evening, I go to the cantina and I play guitar and drink with my friends. I have a full life. But if you had a bigger boat, you could catch more fish and you could make more money and you could, you could buy more boats and make more money and then you could stop selling to the middleman and you could, you could sell directly. You could have a canning factory. You, could, you, you would grow and grow. And then what? Well, you, you, you'd probably have to move to Mexico City because you'd have to run your business and it would be spreading out. And then you might move to Los Angeles or New York and it would grow. And then someday you could put out an IPO and sell it all <laughs> and get millions. And the fisherman looked at him and said, and then what? Well, you could retire, sleep in, and fish a little, play with your kids, go to the cantina. Sometimes we don't see what's right in front of us, the gifts that we've been given in the simple ways and in complex ways. The idea of rich or wealthy was something I've been thinking about for a while. And it came from the comedian Chris Rock. And, and I know we have a lot of Chris Rock fans here in the audience tonight. No? OK. I, 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 Chris has a, has a wonderful uh, uh, series. And in, in this one part of his routine, he talks about the idea of being rich or being wealthy. And, and why aren't there more role models for being wealthy? And I wanted to play that clip for you, but I'd have to bleep out so much it would sound like a busy signal on the phone. <laughs> so I decided that I would just tell you about it instead. But what gets lost from people who don't listen to Chris Rock and get past the language is that he's a very, very smart man. And he has some really good ideas. And he talks about the idea that we can get rich we can win the lottery, and we can get rich. But then we can just spend it. We all want for things. things. Money and things are easy to count up. It's easy to point at that and say, you know, that's mine. I have more than you. That's why I started out the call to worship with this. Oh, Lord, I want, I want a Mercedes. My friends have Porsches. I want something better. But the funny thing about people who get rich quickly and the people who win the lottery is that typically within a year, five at the most, they're in serious debt. The woman who lives in this trailer won the lottery twice. The odds of getting hit by lightning are better than winning the lottery twice. And she lives here. Because sometimes we don't <clears throat> value the gifts that we're given. It's like we're playing, like it's all play money, that it doesn't really mean anything to us. 
It's like a game. That's why I chose Mr. Monopoly. It's all mine. Look at this pile of stuff. This is my pile of stuff. Now, you all, all played Monopoly as kids, right? Do any of you still play Monopoly? It's a great board game. There are 400, over 450 registered versions of Monopoly, including this one right here, Christian Monopoly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, you, you, you'll have to decide for yourself which branch of Christianity created this version of Christian Monopoly because we've got this get out of hell free card. <laughs> and oh yes, there are go to hell cards in here too. <laughs> yeah. And instead of the railroads, they did a very interesting thing here. They tithe. So the Catholic Church tithes 10% if you land on that space. Methodist, 15. <laughs> Ecumenical, 20. Baptist, 25. Not sure which end of the spectrum created this game, <laughs> but I just love that they decided that tithing was the thing that we should put down for the railroads there. They've even gone so far as you get salary when you pass God. <laughs> I think you're supposed to get to God, not go past. I don't know what the thought was there. But it's interesting to see them take something that's so much about stuff, so much about getting ahead, and try to make it into Christianity. Now, there have been people in the history of our country who weren't very nice people. This is one of them. John D. Rockefeller became the richest man in the country when he was alive, and he left quite a legacy. But he did it by being absolutely, completely ruthless. But he spent 40 years of his retirement giving away his money and left a legacy that continues today and left one of the richest families today still. Same with Carnegie. He came over as a, as a boy from Scotland and worked in the, the mills as a runner. He would take orders around and he would take uh, materials around. And he built up somehow from there to build U.S. steel and to ruthlessly crush the competition. And when you want to talk about monopolies and busting monopolies these days, you talk about these two guys. But the Carnegie Foundations Carnegie libraries, and so many other things that have endured because he realized that there's only so much money any person needs, and he should give it away. And that's exactly what he did. Then there's this guy. We all know Bill Gates. Now, most of you know that I'm an Apple guy. I'm a Mac guy. So for me, this was Darth Vader for a long time. This was the evil empire. But it was interesting with Bill Gates. He achieved, what do you do when you achieve all your dreams? You've got to come up with new ones. And so all these guys, like Mr. Monopoly with this pile and said, this is mine. Well, they changed their tune a little bit. They decided, well, maybe it's yours. Maybe I can find something better to do than just make money. So Bill Gates gets together with Warren Buffett, the number one and two richest men in the world at the time, and said, you know what we should do? We should get all of our friends who are rich, wealthy, to give away their money too. So not only did they commit to give away their fortunes, but to get other people to do the same to share, to value that gift so much that you would give it to someone else. A remarkable thing in this time when we value that wealth so, so very greatly. Now, if she knew I was going to embarrass her, 
And I told her I wouldn't ask her to stand up, and I won't. <laughs> but it's not all about money. We've all received different gifts. And some of us have received the gifts of knowledge and of teaching. When Denise Warner joined this church, she wasn't a teacher. She worked for the Rand Corporation, a think tank in Santa Monica. And she came here one day, and Reverend Mark Ulrichsen was preaching a sermon about the gifts of the Spirit. And she realized that she had a good job, but what she really wanted to do was work with kids. She wanted to teach. So she and her husband Drew discussed it, and she said, well, I'll take a test and see how that goes, and if that goes okay, maybe I'll take the next one. And she worked her way through classes and tests and became a teacher. And she's a wonderful teacher. But she didn't do it for the money. Nobody goes into teaching for the money. <laughs> and we have a lot of people here in this room who know that. We have every grade level, including a lot of university, represented in this room. Teachers who have a gift, and they want to say it's yours. They want to give it away. Now, not as many of you people may know Greg Batson. Greg's a friend of our family. He's one of my brother's very best friends. And he's the pastor down at the United Methodist Church in Tustin, where uh, Karen Ellis, formerly Karen Delaney, thank you. So I've been calling her Karen, Karen Ellis so long now, I forgot Karen Delaney, who was one of our associates for a long time. She's his associate down there. But Greg used to live in New York, where he was an investment banker, and a very good one. His wife, Tanya, is a very accomplished opera singer. Yet, somewhere along the way, he felt a call to go into ministry. Nobody goes into ministry for the money. And he and his family took a huge pay cut, big lifestyle change for all of them, so that Greg could go into ministry. And he's a wonderful pastor because it's so in his soul that that's what he had to do. We've each got these gifts. When we ask for the offering, everybody always thinks it's about tithing and it's about money. And it's not. Those are helpful things. Capital is good. Gandhi said capital is good. It's a tool. But it's not the end. It is learning to give learning to offer up the gifts that you've been given to others in service and generosity. So what about you and I? We know what their gifts are. What are ours? We each have to answer that question on our own, but we need to take time in prayer with God to answer it. Because we don't want to just be rich with our talent, or rich with our spirit. We want to be wealthy and give it away and watch it grow. That's the difference between rich and wealthy. This is ours. This is ours. When Jesus died for us, we think about the sacrifice but it was the love, it was the offering, it was the giving for all of us that we have to share. And we don't get to just keep it. We get to give it away, and it's a great thing to give away. I've never been much for evangelism, and I've, I've always admired those people who come to my door who want to talk to me about the love of Jesus. Because honestly, for me to go to another person and do that is uncomfortable. But it's not uncomfortable for someone else to ask me that and for them for me to answer. 
And it's not uncomfortable for me to walk down the street or into the supermarket or anywhere else and be a Christian. And that's a way of giving it away. That's a way of helping, of offering, of showing that you have a gift that you're willing to share. Money's dandy, and we like to use it. But love is better if you don't refuse it. This is also from a song. This is from one of our Methodist songs. Does anybody know? Barbara knows? It is. Love is like a penny. Like the woman who gives her offering in the scripture this morning. She takes the last of what she has and freely gives it because she knows that in giving it will bless others and it will grow. Love is like a magic penny. Hold it tight, and you won't have any, right? But lend it and spend it, and you'll have so many they'll roll all over the floor. That's the gift of spiritual wealth. That's the gift of the talents and the love and the inspiration that God has given to each of you. It's different, as different as the faces in this room but if you don't spend it and lend it, you waste it. There's no age limit on it. It never expires. But you can make someone else wealthy. You might volunteer to help students with their homework. You might sing. You might do art that inspires others. I don't know what your gift is, but I sure look forward to finding out. So think about it. Are you rich or are you wealthy? And do you want to find out? Amen.